Mandy and I were married for 11 years. We had two children, Trevor, who was 10, and Jasmine, who was 8. I always thought we had a good marriage. Like most marriages, we made love constantly in the early years. We had a pretty busy personal life. I bought one of those Chinese books about a thousand ways to please you in sex. About six of them were pretty good. The Chinese can take the rest back. I'm Clyde, and I looked like Clyde, big and burly. I'm a pretty big guy, and I'm not afraid of much. We tried to satisfy each other using different ways. I have to say she was good. Like many young people, we were deeply in debt. It was our own fault. We wanted what our parents had, but we wanted it now. It took our parents 30 years to collect their belongings. It wasn't just that Mandy was spending money. I, too, wanted new toys, all new appliances, and a big screen TV, to name a few. Anyway, we got into debt. I was already working in a factory six days a week. We received profit-sharing checks, but due to the economy, they seemed to be much smaller. Anyway, Mandy said she could go to work. I felt guilty that I couldn't support my family, but it was the only way to get rid of our debt. Mandy got a job at one of the local department stores. She didn't earn much but was able to work around her child's schedule. Of course, this meant that I didn't see her very often, at least not as often as I would like. The days when we made love became less and less frequent and passed far apart. Mandy said that between the kids and work, she just wasn't in the mood. I could understand that. There were days when I was not ready for this either. We used to always argue about money, but now it was about taking care of the house. She told me I needed to do more. She was probably right, so I tried. But then it turned out that I couldn't do everything well enough or I didn't do it the way she wanted. You have to understand that I didn't mind doing anything. But if I had to do it, it would be my way. One argument after another led to the refusal of sex. I think this was my punishment for not doing everything the way she wanted. I started going to the bar while she was working. I was just angry and tired of being alone. The children always went to their grandparents' house because Mandy's parents had a swimming pool. We couldn't afford it. I met a few women at a bar, but I didn't do anything except talk to them. I did buy them a few drinks. It dawned on Mandy that I was hanging out at the bar. She was really angry and told me that if I was gonna fuck some slut, she might as well do the same. I told her it wasn't true, and whoever told her I was cheating on her was a fucking liar. She didn't tell me who it was. She just went to bed and locked herself out of me. I thought about breaking down the door, but then I would have to fix it. I figured she'd get over it, so I slept on the couch. We didn't get along at all then. We argued about all sorts of trifles. We didn't talk anymore. We both threatened each other with divorce over nonsense. The children spent more and more time with Mandy's parents. I think it was unpleasant for them to see us arguing, and it hurt them too. On Friday, I told Mandy that I was taking Saturday off and going fishing. I needed to collect my thoughts. Mandy said, We need money, and you're taking the day off. What the hell is wrong with you? This was another argument. Mandy accused me of taking one girl from the bar with me. I didn't know where she got this information from, but she didn't tell me. This was not true. Although I admit that over the past few weeks, one of them continued to pester me. I liked the attention, but I didn't do anything with her. I did talk to her quite lewdly, but to be honest, I never touched her. One day she reached out and grabbed my manhood in my pants. It actually felt good, but I put my hand on top and removed hers. I told her that Mandy and I had problems in our marriage, but I wouldn't cheat on her. On Saturday, I got up, grabbed my fishing gear and went for a walk. I was gone for about four hours when I think I finally came to my senses. Sometimes you need to be alone in the wilderness to clear your mind. That's what fishing did for me. I realized how stupid Mandy and I had been. Instead of speaking with a clear head, we both argued, neither of us giving an inch. I decided to go home so the two of us could sit down like adults and work through our problems. When I arrived home, there was a strange car parked in my driveway. I quietly entered my house and listened for any sounds. I heard Mandy say, Ralph, it's not right, even if Clyde is cheating on me. I looked into the room and saw that Ralph had his hand on Mandy's chest. Her blouse was unbuttoned and her bra was pulled up above her breasts. I entered the room. Oh my God, Clyde, 
What are you doing at home? It's not what you think, Mandy said. God, what a stupid phrase. We were both smarter than that. I grabbed Ralph's hand and pulled him off the couch. His pants were unzipped and his tool was hanging out. I picked him up and punched him hard in the stomach. I hit him with a right cross to the jaw. I think I may have dislocated his jaw. I threw it across the living room, knocking over the table and lamp. I jumped on him and hit him again and again. I stood up and kicked him in the crotch. All this time, Mandy was screaming and crying, demanding that I stop. I picked up the nearly lifeless piece of crap and tossed it out the door onto my lawn. You fucking slut. Get the fuck out of my house. I grabbed at her, and she screamed as I threw her out the front door, with her breast still sticking out. I slammed the door and locked it. I heard Mandy outside screaming for me to let her in. She needed to talk to me and call an ambulance for Ralph. I did neither, but about five minutes later, a patrol car and an ambulance arrived. They told me to open the door, otherwise they would break it down. I opened it, and they rushed inside. They told me to lie face down on the floor with my legs spread. One officer pressed his knee into my back and handcuffed me. The ambulance was already taking the unconscious Ralph to the hospital. Mandy tidied up her clothes. They spoke to Mandy and took her statement. I didn't say a word. They read me my rights and I refused to speak. They put me in a patrol car and took me to jail. Mandy called the prison and even came there. I told the officers running the place that I didn't want to talk to her. It was one of the few rights I had left. The officer, a nice guy named Joe, came up to my holding cell to talk to me. Off the record, Clyde, what the hell happened? Connection or lack thereof, I answered. My wife was getting ready to have sex with a guy on my couch. I'm not a fucking weakling, so I took matters into my own hands. Did you hear her side of the story, Clyde? He asked. Joe, let me make it very simple. Nobody forced her. She was going to do this of her own free will. What kind of man would I be if I took crap like that? I did what I had to do. Now I guess I'll have to pay for it, I said. I refused to even try to post bail. I told them that I wasn't going to waste money that could be useful to my family, so I might as well just go home in this situation. They were going to hire me, one of those lawyers provided by the state. I was fine with that. He'll be gone for at least a day or so. In any case, I needed time to cool down. Joe returned with a letter from Mandy. I immediately told him that I didn't even want to read it. When I finally saw my lawyer, he told me I was in a lot of trouble. He wanted me to admit that I was insane. I laughed and told him I knew exactly what I was doing and if that asshole came near Mandy again, he would get a second show. I actually asked, did I kill the bastard? Damn close, said my lawyer. Broken jaw, two ribs, two black eyes and God knows what else. The police couldn't even accept his statement about what happened. He was unable to speak. All they have is your wife's statement, right? Now, I'm going to visit her tomorrow myself. Is there anything you would like me to say to her? Yes, I want to. Tell her that she is now free to have sex with whoever she wants, and I want a divorce, I said. I just became a very stubborn asshole. In prison, you had to be a hard-nosed person. I didn't even talk to Mandy. I refused to meet with her. I did receive several messages from my children saying that they missed me and wanted me to come home. Like I could just say, okay, I think I'll go home tonight. Two months had passed since the beating, and my trial was about to begin. At least something like a pre-trial hearing. The only witnesses were Mandy and this guy Ralph, who I found out worked where Mandy did. I was sitting in the courtroom when they wheeled Ralph in a wheelchair. I think he broke his leg when I threw him out the door. His jaw was still bandaged, but the bruises were mostly healed. My lawyer whispered to me that because of my blow to the groin, he would not be able to have children. He was married, but his wife was divorcing him because of this fiasco. He wrote most of his statements because he was difficult to understand due to the brace on his jaw. I looked back at the courtroom door and saw Mandy standing there. I felt anger and pain when I saw her. She was foresaid to appear at the hearing as a reluctant witness. They said she didn't have to testify against me, but she had to give her testimony about what happened. Well, I guess I had to hear it after all. Ralph was called first, 
He basically said or wrote that Mandy invited him over, and they became intimate when I burst into the room and started beating him before he could even defend himself. He said he and Mandy were two consenting adults. He told the judge that I never gave anyone a chance to explain anything. I just attacked him brutally. I wanted to get up and slap him across the face again. I would have done that if I thought I could get closer to him. Mandy gave him a very mean look and cried when she looked at me. Mandy was called to testify. She told the judge she worked with Ralph. He pestered her quite often, and she always rejected his advances. He recently told her that her husband was cheating on her. She refused to believe it and even told Ralph that she had talked to me about it. Then one day Ralph came with photos of some slut with her hand on my crotch. Now I understand where I saw Ralph before. He was hanging around Jake's bar where I was drinking. He always kept his distance and never spoke to me. This bastard was taking pictures to use against me. Then Mandy said, I was completely shocked after I found out that Clyde was cheating on me. Ralph told me that I should get even with him and do the same thing he did. I was confused. I love Clyde, but when we get angry, we do stupid things. I told Ralph about how Clyde went fishing, and he told me that he overheard Clyde asking a bar slut to go with him. I was hurt, and maybe I even wanted to get even. I don't know. I was so embarrassed. On that terrible Saturday, Clyde left and didn't even kiss me goodbye. The children got up and asked to visit my mother for the day. This left me alone in the house wondering what Clyde was doing. Then Ralph showed up at my door. I asked him what he was doing there and he told me that he thought I could use some company since my husband was cheating on me. This son of a bitch set us up. I really hope the judge noticed this. Of course, Mandy let him in and seeing him in a wheelchair wouldn't have helped me much. Mandy continued, Ralph came in and I poured him a cup of coffee. We started talking about what Clyde was probably doing right now, and Ralph started hitting on me. He began to undo the buttons on my blouse and pulled my bra over my chest. I didn't understand what I was doing. I didn't want this man. I wanted my Clyde. But I sat there and let him touch me. I watched as he bent down and unzipped his trousers. I remember telling him that it was wrong, even if Clyde did cheat on me. The next thing I knew, Clyde came in and grabbed Ralph's arm. I was afraid that Clyde would kill him and send me away. I know I screamed at Clyde to stop, but he was crazy. He threw Ralph out the door, and then he called me a slut and threw me out too. A few minutes later, the police arrived with an ambulance. Mandy testified in court in tears. I tried to contact Clyde and talk to him, but he refused to see me. I was so stupid, so stupid. She came down from the podium and looked at me in tears. I had such mixed emotions. They had never done this before, she said, and there was a good chance she wouldn't have gone through with it. I knew she was hurting, but there was nothing I could do except watch. This idiot has ruined our lives. When I made my statement, I made the mistake of saying that I would do it again. At the end of the whole process, I was charged with assault and battery. The judge said that even though it happened in my home, Ralph was considered a guest. I could have asked him to leave but legally I couldn't beat him to a pulp. The judge gave me four years. Mandy left the courtroom in tears. I never talked to her. One day, sitting in my cell, I decided to write to her. I needed to say something, and I had to get it off my chest. Dear Mandy, I really love you and always have. I've never cheated on you. If you go to a bar and ask Sue, I'm sure she'll tell you the truth. I'll ask the lawyer to send you the divorce papers. You are too beautiful a woman to be alone. We made some serious mistakes that I will always regret. If we had communicated more with each other, this might not have happened. I wish I could have, I should have, but now it's too late. Tell Trevor and Jasmine I love them. It's a pity that their father is a criminal. I just couldn't stand by and let this happen. I am not that kind of person. Now I only regret that you didn't believe me and decided to take revenge instead of talking to me. I hope you can find someone. Please forget about me and move on with your life. You should receive your divorce papers any day now. Always loving you. Clyde, I sent off the divorce papers and gave all of our property to Mandy. Where I live now, I did not need anything. They even gave me food and underwear. All I could do now was waste my time. I had no real skills other than working as a laborer.
so I started trying to improve myself by enrolling in rehab programs. At least when I get out, I might be able to find a job. I was included in the welding program. I did some welding at my old job, but now I could become a master welder and maybe build a future when I get out. Every night I thought about my family, about my children left without a father, and about Mandy living without me. Life really sucked. About two months passed, and the cell duty officer said that I had a visitor. I assumed it was the lawyer with my divorce papers. There were two types of visitation centers in this prison. The ones with glass between them where you talk on the phone, and the others where you sit at a table and talk face to face. There was minimal touching in this visiting area. She was the one I was sent to. Mandy was waiting for me at the table. She raised her eyes, looked at me, and began to cry. Hello, Mandy. What brought you here? I asked. I don't want a divorce. I will wait for you as long as necessary. I don't need anyone but you. I made a terrible mistake by not trusting you. This will never happen again. I know you might not believe me, but I don't think I would have gone any further than I did. I felt so guilty. I was almost glad when you came in. Our lives are now a complete mess because of what we both did. I take half the blame for being so stupid in not trusting you. I actually dated this woman, Sue, and she told me that she really cared about you and tried to be affectionate, but you told her that you were happily married and wouldn't cheat on me. I told her about Ralph and the pictures and she got really angry. What she actually said was that she had to kill the bastard. How are the children doing? Everything is all right with them? I asked. They are doing as well as could be expected. I can't afford this house, and we're selling it. We moved in with Mom and Dad for a while until we could get back on our feet. We are closing on the house next week. I put all our furniture and your personal belongings in storage. When you get out, we can start over. She started crying. I am so sorry. I miss you so much. I cannot live without you. I love you, Clyde. I miss you, too but you need to move on with your life. I can't expect you to wait for me for another three years or so, I replied. I told you, I'm not going to get a divorce. I'm waiting for you. If you want a divorce when you get out, then I will sign the papers, but not before, she replied. We talked a little more, and then I asked the officer for permission to kiss her goodbye. She kissed me very tenderly and tears streamed down her face. She told me that she would come to see me every month. I told her not to come every month. It would hurt too much every time she left. She agreed to come about once every three months. Prison life continued. About once a month, I received letters from my children in which they told me what they were doing and sometimes sent me a photo. I have one photograph of them with their smiling mother. This was the one I hung on the wall of my cell. I was quite successful in mastering welding techniques. The instructor told me he would give me a job reference when I got out. Mandy checked in with me every three months. She said everything was fine. She changed jobs and worked at another department store, where she was a department manager with a slightly higher salary. Her parents allowed her to save most of the money so she could eventually get back on her feet. I asked her what her parents now thought of me. A criminal. Mom and Dad love you, Clyde. They know you did it because of your temper. They got really mad at me for being so stupid. They told me that I was losing a good husband due to lack of communication. In fact, when the divorce papers came and they saw them, they asked me what I was going to do. When I tore them in front of them, they smiled. Another six months passed, and I was told I had another visitor. He wanted to see me at the glass display, not at the tables. I had no idea who might want to see me. I went to the window. Ralph was there, holding the telephone receiver. What do you want, you son of a bitch? I asked. I just thought I should let you know that I'm going to follow through, he said. What the hell are you talking about, asshole? I said. The job of seducing your wife. This is what I intended to do and now I am going to finish this work. You know we're dating, right? He said. You lying bastard. When I get out of here, I'm going to finish this job. I'm going to beat your fucking ass. I was really angry, but I couldn't do anything. Maybe I'll even take pictures of how I have your wife and send them to you. You can hang them in your cell, he laughed. I will find you and kill you, you son of a bitch.
I said. He laughed. By then I won't be here. See you, Clyde. He hung up and left. Damn, everything was going pretty well, and now that bastard is back. I was pretty sure Mandy wasn't dating him, but I needed to call her and let her know. Finally, I got to the phone. I could only make calls for a fee. I hope they accept it. Trevor picked up the phone and answered yes to the call. Dad? Hello, Father. How are you? Boy, how nice it is to hear your voice. I really miss you, Dad. I miss you too, Trevor, but right now I have to talk to my mom. Each call only takes me a few minutes. Is she there? He replied, Yes, she is here. Mom, Dad needs you by the phone. I heard her scream, What? On the background. Clyde, is that you? What's the matter, honey? She asked. She knew I wouldn't call unless it was urgent. Have you talked to Ralph lately? I asked. No, of course not. I can't stand that bastard after what he did to us. What's the matter, Clyde? She asked. He showed up here a while ago and said you two were dating. It's a lie, Clyde. A damn lie. You have to believe me, she said. I really believe you, Mandy, but I know he will come for you somehow. I need you to protect yourself and watch this bastard. I don't know what to do next, but I'm warning you. He's going to try to get even to screw you, I said. I'd rather die than let that idiot get close to me. Baby, I'll be okay. You taught me how to take care of myself. It's no use calling the police because they don't respond until something happens. Just be careful. I have to hang up now. I love you, Mandy. It was all I could do. I didn't want to make any more noise without proof. I didn't sleep well for several days. About a week later, another visitor sat down at my table. Clyde, I'm Lieutenant Abrams, and this is Officer Ryan. We're from the sheriff's office. Well, Lieutenant, what do you want from me? I asked. About three days ago, as far as we could tell, Ralph Medley was shot and killed outside the bar you were visiting. Can you tell us anything about this? Do you also have a gun? Lieutenant, I spent two and a half years here because of that idiot. I couldn't possibly shoot him from here, and no, I don't have a gun. Mandy wouldn't allow guns in the house. According to the visitor log, he was here last week. What did he want? He came to laugh at me, saying that I was locked up and he was free like a bird. I think it was done to rub salt in the wounds, so to speak, I replied. Any ideas who might have a grudge against him? He asked. Look, guys. I don't give a damn about that flying dick. He's dead good riddance to the pathetic scum. Do I care? Hell no. Whoever the hell did this, I hope they get away with it. Although I heard that his ex wasn't too happy with him, I replied. What about your wife? What is her name? Mandy. Perhaps she is interested in seeing him dead, the lieutenant said. Mandy doesn't have the character to do something so disgusting. Damn, she wanted me to call an ambulance after I beat the crap out of him. You're in the wrong place if you're watching Mandy. She has two children whom she must support on her income and now lives with her parents. She doesn't have time to wipe her ass, let alone shoot someone. I laughed. Well, Clyde, thanks for at least talking to us, he said. Hey, were you going to tell me what you know about the shooting? Damn it, officer. I told you everything I know. Quite fair. Ralph walked into Jake's bar around seven o'clock. He was sitting around drinking and met a sexy dressed blonde at the door. She never went inside, so the people at the bar couldn't get a good look at her face. They walked around the parking lot, and the next thing the visitors heard were gunshots, two of them. By the time they got outside, Ralph was dead from two Luger shots to the face. The woman disappeared. We think it might have been her, but we have no evidence of that other than she must have been the last person with him before he was shot. Sorry, I can't help you, but he probably got what he deserved, I said. I wanted to call Mandy and tell her that she didn't have to worry anymore. I was afraid that someone might listen to my phone call, so I just remained sealant. The shooting was reported in the newspapers and they said they had no real suspects. They did mention my name because I beat the crap out of him, but they knew where I was at the time. Next week it was time for Mandy to visit me again. I was so happy to see her. She asked me if I had heard of Ralph. I told her that the police came and talked to me. She told me that they talked to her, too. She told them that depending on the exact time of day, she was working or returning home from work. 
Her parents vouched for the timing of her arrival. I asked her if they asked if we had guns. Yes, they really asked me. I told them I don't allow guns in the house, just like you told me to tell people if they ever asked when you bought one years ago. Where is my Luger? The one we bought a few years ago from that crazy street vendor? I asked. Probably in storage with the rest of your things, she replied. The main thing is that you're safe. That's all that matters. Being in this prison gave me a lot of time to think. Do you think that when I get out, we can put this all behind us and start again? I asked. She smiled at me and said, I know we can. No more secrets and much more communication. I love you, Clyde. I have always done this and will always do this. A couple of months later, I was called into the warden's office. He told me that I would be released early. This will happen in about two weeks. I couldn't be happier. I called Mandy. Honey, can you come and pick me up in about two weeks? I asked. You mean, come and see you? Yes, I can, she replied. No, don't come to see me, but come and pick me up. I'm being released early. I smiled. I heard Mandy start to cry. Oh my God, oh my God, when, what day, at what time? Oh God, Clyde, I'm so happy. She was still crying. Two weeks later, I was released. Mandy came and got me. She had another car. She said the old one was out of order. She looked beautiful when she came up to me and kissed me. She was crying, and there were tears in my eyes. We headed to her parents' house, and they had a sign that said, Walk out. Welcome home, Dad. The children must have done it. My children look so grown up when I hugged and kissed them. Apart from their photographs, I have not seen them for three years. My mother-in-law came and hugged me, and I shook hands with my father-in-law. I carried my suitcase into the house and was greeted by several of our old friends. I wouldn't let Mandy go far from me. Honey, where should I sleep? I asked Mandy. In our bed, silly. A couple of days ago, we moved her downstairs so you and I could have some privacy. It was Dad's idea, but tonight you and I are going to a motel. I have booked a room. I have three years of pent-up love that I have been saving for you. God, how I missed you, she said. After everyone had almost left the party and I said goodnight to my kids, Mandy said we'd see everyone tomorrow. It was pretty funny, if you think about it. Everyone knew where we were going and what we were going to do. I looked in our closet to see if I had any clothes there. I opened one drawer and there was a blonde wig. Mandy came in and saw me looking at it. I bowed it and wore it once. I think I look better as a brunette. She smiled. She pointed to a couple of drawers where she had put some of my clothes. I got a fresh change of clothes and one more chance to take with me to the motel. We headed towards the exit and talked about our future. We both agreed that if either of us had a problem, we would face it head on. No more secrets and a lot of communication. When we got to the motel, we decided to have a drink together. She was sitting at the table looking pretty, and I walked away to get us some drinks. When I turned around, there was a guy sitting next to Mandy. I could hear them talking from where we were waiting for our drinks. Hey, baby, are you all alone here? He asked. Please go away. I'm married and waiting for my husband to return. I ask you in a nice way, Mandy said, but he didn't do it. Damn, baby, why would I be afraid of your old man? He asked. Clyde, honey, please come here, she asked. The man looked at me and said, Sorry, lady and sir, I was mistaken. I mistook you for someone else, and ran out the front door. I looked at Mandy, laughing. What the hell did this all mean? You'd think he saw a ghost, I asked. Honey, you are very well known in this part of the city. You are something of a legend. Almost every man who approached me just had to tell me I was married to Clyde O'Brien and they would leave me alone. Most people still think that you are also responsible for Ralph's death, she replied. We went up to our room and Mandy asked me how I wanted to do it. I told her I wanted fast and furious sex for the first time to release the tension. Then we were going to make slow, intimate love. She undressed as I also took off my clothes. She climbed onto the bed and I followed her. After a few minutes, the two of us climaxed. She looked at me and said, Damn it, honey. I needed this just as much as you. Let me get up, go to the bathroom, and clean this place up so we can truly love each other. I missed you so much. She got off the bed 
and went to the bathroom. I poured each of us a glass when I heard the shower running. I put them aside and went with her to the shower. I took the soap and started washing her back. She turned around when I started to wash her. She moaned and probably felt a little embarrassed. It's okay, honey. I like washing you, I said. I washed and caressed her, which brought her to another climax. I finished my shower, got out of the stall, and waited for her to finish. When she came out, wrapped in a towel, I handed her the drink. A toast to the woman I love. May we always be together. We both took a sip, and I pulled the towel off her and sat her on the edge of the bed. We loved each other for a long time and passionately, and when they finished, she said, I love you so much, Clyde. I think this might be enough for the first six months that you and I lost. That still leaves us two and a half years. I smiled back. In the following weeks, I found a job as a welder for a large company. The person who hired me said that they give a lot of second chances if the employees are good workers, show up on time, and don't do dope. He also told me that I came highly recommended. He never said who. Within a few months, we were able to rent our own house. We had a lease with an option to buy. It was also in the same area where Mandy's parents lived. We were going to be a family again. We walked up to the warehouse building, and Lieutenant Abrams and Officer Ryan were standing there with two other officers who had a search warrant for the warehouse building. I knew they were looking for a Luger. While they were sorting through the boxes, I tried to get Mandy's attention. At that moment, they separated us. One officer came out with a Luger in his hand. He put it in a plastic bag and handed it to the lieutenant. The lieutenant walked up to Mandy and said, I thought you didn't allow guns in your house, Mrs. O'Brien. Mandy looked at him and said that the warehouse building was not her home. Well, young lady, I advise you not to go far from home until we test this Luger. The police left, and I went to Mandy. I thought you already got rid of that gun. God, Mandy, what do we do now? Do? Mandy asked. Do what? Oh, my God, you think I killed Ralph? I didn't do it, Clyde. I don't know who did it, but it wasn't me. I didn't think about the gun until you reminded me of it. The next day, the lieutenant came to our new house and even returned the Luger. He said the serial number was erased and it didn't even have a firing pin. If this were not the case, it would be illegal to own it. Either way, it was completely useless and had probably not been fired at for many years. Mandy told him to keep it or throw it away. She did not allow firearms in her home. She even wondered how it got into the warehouse building. Perhaps it belonged to one of the movers. All she knew was that it wasn't hers. After this strange situation, our lives are pretty much back to normal. The main thing I've learned is to always communicate better with Mandy. She realized that it all started because she didn't trust me. I could still divorce her, but we would both lose a lot of time. Our sex life is as good as it was when we first got married. The only thing she knows is that I won't cheat on her, and she knows what will happen if she cheats on me. It's funny when we meet with friends. They always ask me if they can dance with Mandy. I think I'll become a legend in our little town for a while. About a month ago, we received a call from a lieutenant. He said we were no longer being followed because of Ralph's murder. It was Sue, the woman from the bar. Ralph turned her on, and she let him fuck her. Apparently, she was a psycho black widow bitch. She had sex with men and then killed them when she was done with them. The police were investigating the case of his wife's infidelity and went to the bar to talk to the husband. That's where the man was with Sue. They spoke to her and asked her to look in her car. In the trunk, they found a blonde wig and a luger. She confessed to them that she shot Ralph and three other unsolved murders. They were all husbands who cheated on their wives. The first murder occurred in Atlanta, where her husband was found murdered outside a local bar. It made me think that if I had cheated on Mandy, I might be lying in the alley right now. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18... Don't even think about listening to the next one.